Hey folks, thank you for tuning into the Grad School Sucks podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Matthew Carlson, and each week I'll be bringing you conversations that will help grad students like you survive grad school and thrive in a post-grad school career. If you end up enjoying today's podcast, please leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the description of this episode for links to everything that we talk about today. Without further ado, let's start the episode. Kelly, it is so good to see you. Thank you for coming on the show. To start off, could you just uh, let us know who you are and where we can find you online? Sure. Thank you for having me, Matt. We've known each other on Instagram for a really long time, so it's cool to finally yep. like see your face and have a chat. Um, I'm Dr. Kelly Voss. I use she, her pronouns. I am a community college instructor um, in Southern California, Pasadena City College, and uh you can find me on my my podcast. Uh, Instagram is uh, at Spinal Frontier Pod. Um, my spouse and I have a Star Trek Alien Physiology podcast. It's really it's a really nerdy uh, little pastime we have, but uh, that's the best place to find me publicly. My regular handle is private. So yeah. awesome. Awesome. Okay. Spinal Frontier. I love that name. And I'll have a link to that uh, the podcast and then the Instagram account in the description of this episode. So for those listening, if you want to scroll down, you can just click on those and it'll, it should pull up automatically. So Kelly, it is so good to see you. Uh, not like in person, but you know, live on screen. Um, could you start off with why did you go to grad school in the first place? So I. I started out my college career as a community college transfer student, and I thought I was going to be a French teacher. And then I took intro to marine biology and I was like, no, this is now, this is now my goal. And Mm. so I got it all together, transferred to Cal State Long Beach in Southern California. And I fell in really quickly with the group of graduate students that was in the shark lab. And so I was doing all kinds of fun field work, like out on boats in the middle of the night, the water's bioluminescent. So it feels like freaking Fantasia, like paddling through mm-hmm. this blue sparkly water, like magical at a great time. And all of those graduate students are like, you're like us and you should pursue research. Like you need to be in grad school. This is how you do it. So mm-hmm. I was lucky enough to have people who saw something in me and like treated me as a peer and helped me kind of find a graduate program and get into it that way. So it was just really good undergraduate experiences, getting to know my TAs and people I helped with research. That is awesome. That is so fun. What did you envision grad school would be like before you got there? So I thought, since I knew a bunch of graduate students, like I was one of those undergrads that hung out with the grad students because we I was a little bit older as a transfer student. So they were kind of my peers. And so I just thought it would be more of like, like I kind of saw the ups and downs because all those people mm. were my friends. I saw the like research devastation, like butting up against your advisor, uh, publishing woes, like field work falling apart, whatever. Like I, I, I feel like I was prepared for the hard parts before I came. So I felt like I knew what I was coming up against. Um, but, you know, like I, I, I'd envisioned, I, I feel like I was realistic about it anyway. So yeah. I just thought it, I thought I was going to like, you know, take a few classes, but mostly I'm doing research and maybe being a teaching assistant, but like, you know, just research hand wave. Yeah. I'm going to go yeah. do that thing. I feel yeah. like even if even if you see the realism of it, um, it is very hard to know how you will personally feel about it until you're actually in it. Yeah, no, for sure. And so what was it like to be actually in it once you got to grad school? So, <laughs> so I moved from L.A. County to Anchorage, Alaska. So it was a little bit of a culture shock. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> I, okay. I did my master's degree at uh, Alaska Pacific University in Anchorage. And um, my master's advisor's uh, advisory style was very different than what I saw at uh, Cal State Long Beach. I think the first like hot tip about grad school is like, definitely go. Don't just talk to the person. 
go there and see and actually tour mm. because I didn't actually tour. I was accepted and I was like, okay. And I just went and I did my due diligence. I, I thought I did anyway. Like I tried to Google stuff and like email the two people who were already in the lab and sure that's great. Um, but I didn't actually get to go. And this was a little bit before the yeah. Skype existed and I Skyped my master's advisor like once, but it wasn't really like video chatting wasn't really as common. So um, I didn't really get to talk to many people up there before I went. And so it was kind of a surprise when I showed up, you know, so it was yeah. a little bit of a learning curve there. And like, personally, my stepdad passed away from cancer, like my first, oh. like in the beginning of my first semester. And so that kind of changed how I interacted with grad school too, because my personal life got a lot more different and I was very far from my family. Um, so that, yeah, it, it was like, I think I just had kind of a rough entry just for a lot yeah. of everything changed very abruptly all at the same time. So um, uh, this, so it's just my own personal experience of grad school being like very jarring, but part of it is like moving time zones and uh, trying to develop a support system with people that I'd never met before. And it was, it was weird. It was weird and hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the research itself, though, was good because, uh, I mean, who doesn't like, so my specialty is uh, octopus behavior and morphology. So I was playing with octopuses every day like that. That was the best part. Honestly, the research was my favorite part of grad school, at least starting out. Yeah, that's so fun. So before we move on to uh, the next part, I noticed you said octopuses and this is a conversation we've had before in the dms Always. yeah so i've heard octopi for my entire life probably and from people who are like you know it's octopi and i was like I, I guess it is okay i don't know how to challenge you so what what actually is it it's the octopuses english, the english language is dirty and messy <laughs> is my preface for that um so we have three different uh, correct, quote unquote, correct plurals for octopus. In scientific literature, like when I'm publishing and when my colleagues publish, we say octopuses because that's the most common um, like Latin root uh, uh, plural. Mm -hmm. And so octopus, octopuses. But if you want to make a really good pun, octopi, fantastic. Go for it. It's a very common common plural at this point so feel free to use it i don't say i say octopuses just because that's what my yeah. i use professionally but if we want to be the most correct we want to be pedantic about it um the greek it's a greek word it's a greek root word and so the greek plural is octopodes so like octo because pods meaning feet and so and then octopodes is the way you say oh. that so there's three different plurals <laughs> but for puns Octopi is the best one for sure. Octopodes is the most like, I know something you don't know. So yeah. <laughs> that is so funny. Yeah. Fun fact, everyone. Fun fact. Here you go. Uh, okay. So you, you, you had your master's program. You were already focusing on the octopus animal. Um, and then where, where did you start thinking about like a doctoral program? Cause you did them separately, right? Yes. Well, <laughs> so sort of, so I have, two masters and a PhD. Oh, like a, hell yeah. I, yeah. I, well, so at UC, so I, I did my PhD at UC Santa Cruz. And when you're doing that at a university of California school, um, when you're in the master in the PhD program at the point that you uh, propose your thesis, that that halfway point and you advance to candidacy, when you advance, you can apply for a non-terminal master's. So I have a master of science from Alaska, but I have an MA from UCSC that I, and then I just kept going and finished and got the PhD. But okay. um, yeah, so that's, that's my silly, <laughs> I just kind of picked it. I was like, why not? It's already there. I'll just have them send me the paper. It's great. It's fine. So um, I was probably two thirds of the way through, like I, I did a three year master's. So um, probably my second year, I was like, you know, I was, my my P or my master's advisor's uh, style was very hands off, and so mm -hmm. I did a lot of stuff very independently. And so I was the one who was like, I need to go to a conference at least once a year, 
like at least one conference I need to go. And so like I saved my tiny grad school, like it was a private school. So I got like a pretty decent uh, uh, income, but I didn't, I don't know. Like I, I just didn't have a ton of money, but like I saved yeah. what money I could to go to at least one conference a year. And I was like, I'm going to do posters. I have to do this, whatever, because um, I was never really asked to publish and mm-hmm. I still haven't published my master's thesis. You can't find it anywhere. Um, but yeah. long story short, octopuses have giant Pacific octopuses have personalities. Huh. Uh, awesome. <laughs> but, uh, that, that was, that was what I was working on. But like, I, I had a very hands-off advisor. I did a lot of stuff independently and I was like, I feel like I'm not getting enough to be the researcher that I want to be. And in my like dealings with other people and travels around, like I helped someone track octopuses. My um, colleague is uh, Dr. Jenny Hoffmeister and she's um, a, a Cal Fish and Wildlife biologist in uh, San Diego now but Mm -hmm. at the time she was in grad school and she needed someone to help her track octopuses underwater I was like I know how to do that from the shark lab from a while ago so let's work together and in talking to her I'm thinking about all of these things that I haven't really learned yet and seeing what a PhD is like because I'd never the only people with PhDs I'd ever met were my professors and mm-hmm. I'd only ever gone to institutions that were master's granting institutions. And so I didn't really know what the PhD was like um, until I met her and then started going to conferences, meeting her friends, meeting other colleagues from all across the country. So it took me being independent and going to conferences to find out what that next step was like. Uh, so, so it was... Uh, very independently driven. And then I was like, you know, I need more skills if I really want, because I I wanted, I've always wanted to be some kind of uh, teacher, mentor, or something. And I really liked the idea of being able to um, do oct- fun octopus research. Like it's really, it's really enjoyable. I had a really good time because I got to choose what I wanted to do for my master's, which is really lucky in biology. So um, I, I was doing some project independently and then I was like well how, how can I incorporate more skills into this and how can I develop my teaching too because I I TA'd classes of like five people at my tiny tiny private school and so I was like I, I wanted more I wanted more out of yeah. the like, an academic experience and in my working with Jenny um, the other octopus researcher uh, I met my PhD advisor because she specialized in the thing that eats octopuses on Catalina at the field station where we all met. So uh, I contacted her, was like, hey, I we met on Catalina. Um, I'm really interested in uh, studying the thing that your animal eats and how yeah. can we work on this together? So it turned into this conversation where, where we developed these ideas, multiple ideas, and, and figured out how to fit all of these things together of how it, it kind of started with Um, how are octopuses losing their arms to California mores and then built from there. So really it was like, I found my PhD advisor happenstance in the dive locker at a Marine station um, and then figured it out with her years later. But uh, I, I think it was just the, the decision to continue on from a master's and go into six more years of grad school. I was in grad school for nine years. Um, yeah. That uh, it, it, The undertaking was very independent. Like I, I really wanted to do it because I felt like I hadn't developed enough skills to do what I really wanted to do um, as a scientist. Yeah, that makes sense. So then you went, you finished up your master's program in Alaska and you came back to California to do your doctoral program. Is that correct? Yeah, I went, <laughs> I never took a break. That. We can talk about that later, but like I went right from undergrad to Alaska, Alaska back to Northern California, and I did six years of PhD uh, in Santa Cruz. Yeah. Yep. What was your PhD program like? How did it differ from your master's? Oh, night and day difference because it's a humongous, like R1 research public university. Very, very different than a tiny uh, private school in the middle of. Absolutely. I mean, Anchorage, Alaska is like, people live there. It's a city, but it's very different. Yeah. <laughs> so um, it was kind of nice to be back close-ish to home and 
Um, Santa Cruz is where I met my spouse as well. Um, I, I married a local and took them with me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the program itself was really great. Um, I was one of the largest, I'm a member of one of the largest cohorts the department has ever had, 22 mm. of us. Um, wow. I was four master's students and 18, I did the math, 18 uh, PhD students. So uh, the department is fairly large too. We're actually, um, it's the ecology and evolutionary biology department, and we are mostly housed in um an auxiliary campus, it's the coastal campus, and it's beautiful. It's in the middle of a little um, kind of wildlife preserve area. And we can walk to the ocean at lunchtime and look over the cliff and there's a whale there. Like literally it's it's dreamy. It's a really great uh, place to do your PhD because you can um, take your uh, depression walks yeah. <laughs> during that <laughs> lunchtime and go see some nature, touch some grass and come back. <laughs> um, my so my cohort's fantastic still talk to a bunch of them um we're starting to graduate now it took us a little longer like we the majority of us probably would have graduated in five years had it not been for the pandemic yeah. um i was one of the first to defend it like i wasn't the first but i was like one of the very first out of our um our cohort to leave and graduate um and that was last year so mm -hmm. it, it's it hasn't really been very long um and a, quite a few of them are still there but man like grad students will know this <laughs> like when you're trying to schedule a defense for your department like I, you need to schedule there's certain slots that you're supposed or at least in our departments there's so many of us they need to slot us out and they only have certain designated times so people can actually show up but when there's like 20 people competing for like 10 slots in uh these 10 week quarters because we're on we were on the quarter system like mm. just that, that was a special circle <laughs> trying to just work it out with everybody and we're like okay because they only want to schedule one defense per day because it's usually a big party after right and so sure. like your whole they they don't want two whole families invading the coastal campus to like and there's there's people everywhere and there's stuff and especially like for me, I was the first person in my department to defend in person again mm -hmm. uh, in the spring of last year. And so uh, people weren't quite sure how that was going to work. And like all the windows were open and everyone was very like, because uh, it's California, we're, we're all yeah. masky uh, still. So yeah. it was weird for me to talk to a room full of people without a mask on. I don't know. So yeah, it was, oh. it was yeah it was interesting I, i'm definitely rambling about just my broad experience end to end but um i just think it was a really good time like my lab was very much like my family we got together on holidays like easter and, and christmas like and we would do field work together over the summer so uh, we were all pretty close um and i still talk to all of them uh regularly too um yeah yeah, and my, awesome. my, my PhD advisor came to my wedding. Like, like it, it was oh, just wow. nice to feel, especially because it was like my master's experience was so hands off. Being sure. part of an actual a community where you're expected to be part of the community was very, very different and interesting and nice. Like it was, it was overall a positive experience compared to um, that master's. And I also sure. it was also another place where. Um, I got a grant for the first half of my PhD and I was expected to teach and learn mm -hmm. um, active learning pedagogy. And um, I was given more opportunities later on down the line to get um, anti-racist pedagogy certification. And um, I ended up being on a paper with a bunch of my friends from my department um, that ended up in nature, um, nature ecology and evolution of how departments can be um facilitating more anti-racist practices in like classes and labs and departments so i don't know i, I feel like i got this really excellent well-rounded development because i got to think about heavy research i did three chapters and i got to do mm -hmm. like develop myself as an educator as well and then i got to be part of this really cool community of biologists that's awesome. The community, I, I still think about the, the community uh, in, you know, various grad programs. Not all of them are like, you know, warm and welcoming and close, but I think 
the community that I experienced was definitely the thing that I probably missed most about academia, which leads me to my next question. Uh-huh. Um, so when, when did you start thinking about like, where is this going career wise? Like after I graduate, like what were you were thinking while you were a grad student? So the first half, and this is kind of ironic because the first half of my PhD, I'm the first three years, I'm like, okay, like I'm uh, getting, like I have to do this education training for, you know, my grant, but I'm not going to TA for a long time and, you know, whatever. Like, I just got to get on top of this research. Like, let's figure out what I'm doing with these octopuses. And then like right after I defended March, 2020. And so I was shut in and isolated from all those, like isolated from that whole community. We tried to do zoom stuff and it was just really bad. Like we all know. And I was just so, um, it was really depressing. It was a really hard time because I'm a really extroverted person for the most part, or I, I was, I don't know. I'm a little broken <laughs> But, yeah. but generally, like, I like to talk and I like to interact with people. And it was really hard to not do that. And I, it was just me and uh, my partner in our apartment and our cat. Like, that was it. I was, And then um, I was trying to teach. Like, at the time, I, I had gotten to the point I was past an advanced to candidacy. And I was TAing. And so I was expected to teach lab sections, lab sections, animal physiology lab sections mm-hmm. where you like, I didn't have to do dissections in my bedroom, thankfully, but like I had to figure out lab activities on the fly, more or less, like a couple of days in advance. And me, it was my responsibility with uh, with my other um, lab mate. We were trying to work it out together, but she was in a whole nother city and we're just trying to like do stuff on Zoom and collect data like collect uh, temperature measurements from my mom's dog and like her, my lab mate's chicken. It was, oh my God. It, <laughs> that is, that is the level of uh, dragging our family and pets into <laughs> our lab teaching. But as I was doing all of this stuff, I'm like, everything is shut down. I have these horrible office hours where I have students crying to me on zoom in my bedroom. Like it's, and I can't even call I can't even call anybody. I can't <clears throat> call Title IX to like if someone's having a problem because I don't know where they are. Like technically right. they're on campus because we're meeting under the auspices of my class. But like, like, yeah, there was a situation where I I was worried about a student and like I couldn't send anybody after like to go help yeah. them because I didn't know where they were, you know? So it was it was very isolating. It was very challenging. But the thing that crystallized very quickly that I didn't, I never thought would happen. Cause I, I was a researcher. I was a field biologist. I was gonna go solve octopus problems or whatever, you know, like I, you know, mm-hmm. I, you just get so um, into your research field, but my research got taken away basically. Like I, I was a field biologist, but the Marine stations closed. They're not letting people on the Island, uh, you know, oh, like really? I, cause I, I was, I was, um, on mainland and you have to travel to do that number one number two um the people that are on the island that live on the island they're like well the best way to keep COVID off our island is to not have people come Mm -hmm. and so the so usc shut down their marine station and it was like they it was like two weeks it was still at the point where it was like oh two more weeks we'll delay it two more weeks we'll delay it and it just got delayed through the whole summer and i was just like I, I'm not even going to try. And then the next year was the same thing. Um, well, it, it was like later, later, later. And then they finally let us come. And like, it was very, it was a very weird, different experience um, with COVID protocols on a desert island. Holy yeah. what? <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I realized that I cared less about my research getting taken away than the people that I was mm interacting with in class and like I like being a teacher like I'm pretty hammy in front of a group of people but like I don't know I just realized I I cared a lot about making sure what I was doing and what I was giving my students even though they were all disengaged black screens across like I'm yelling into the void of black boxes like Mm -hmm. I still cared about what was going on with them and I managed to foster student relationships to the point where like I felt comfortable writing letters of recommendation for some of these folks because they actually wow. came to my office hours I actually got to talk to them and so it, it 
it kind of snuck up on me over about a year or so that I was like, I, I was a research biologist. I was a field biologist. Um, and that's my expertise, but like, I really, I really think I'm an educator. Like I think I mm -hmm. primarily want to be an educator. And so that once I realized that, uh, it was harder to get all of my research done because I was like, sure. I just want to finish this. I don't like, I'm just going to be a teacher. Like, mm. <laughs> but, but you know, you have to finish the research to finish the PhD. So I, I managed to do it and like, it was still fun. It's just like, you know, the, the part at the end is always terrible, right? The editing and the submitting and getting rejected and it's awful <laughs> reviewer two, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> but, yeah. but like I, I got through that in order to pursue um, being a, a teaching professor. I, I mm -hmm. realized I'm like, I can't have my job be tied to research. It's too precarious and it's weirdly personal. You're like, did you feel yeah. that when you were in, when you were kind of finishing your stuff? Like it just feels very, you're, you have these personal stakes in it that you don't feel anymore. Yeah. I, I, um, I did feel like it was very personal. I think for me, it was different because my research topic was tied to like the clinical population I was working with as a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I, I had some, I had a lot of emotions of like wanting to save the world and then, you know, mixed emotions about like maybe doubting the capacity that I could actually do that by being a researcher or, you know, just kind of like I came in kind of naive and then was like, Oh, you know, it just didn't turn out to be what I thought it would be. But yeah, it did feel very personal, especially on the job market. Yeah. <laughs> very personal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do we want to talk about that? Absolutely. What was the job market like for you? Sure. So I feel very lucky. I feel like here's, so what I did, what I did was I decided I was going to look for these teaching professor jobs because I did a lot of work under a teaching professor. I did a lot of my teaching assistantships were uh, with Robin Duncan, who is this fantastic pedagogue. She, she helps run the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at UC Santa Cruz, and she kills it. And students love her. And she has just, she taught me so many things. And um, <laughs> so inactive active learning like there's a lot of timers like you're like okay hmm. take two minutes to talk about this and then we'll come back and so you have little little egg timers or whatever and she gave me my first set of timers and I cried <laughs> goofy super goofy but that's like fun. but that's but but it, but it was very meaningful because that's yeah it was kind of this like passing on of the tools from someone who was a mentor in a way that I didn't expect to receive mentorship like I I, I was going to be a researcher my PhD advisor who is wonderful was going to be the only, you know, what was going to be the mentor, but it turns yeah. out I got a whole slew of other skills from this other instructor who just, just a wonderful human being. And so, um, that was the type of job I was aiming to look for because I was like, yeah. I can't have a job that depends on me getting grants for octopus research because it's almost impossible. I've seen way better, way more capable people than me in my kind of cephalopod area of the world, um, not get like, they're just jumping from postdoc to postdoc, not actually getting yeah. positions because yeah. it's very difficult to convince people to let you run a lab off of a new lab off of cephalopod stuff. And that's just in the, in the United States, mainly like Europe is doing great. Japan's doing great. Like Oceania. Fantastic. We don't have it. So, um, mm we, I, I was like, I can't, I can't have research be tied to my job. So I looked and looked and looked, I started looking like the beginning of my last year and I was freaking out cause I couldn't find any jobs because I didn't really know when jobs would open because mm -hmm. I was just looking for like anything. And I found very little as far as four-year schools went. I think me, I think I applied to maybe one. Um, but the majority of, um, teaching positions and tenure track teaching positions. Cause that's what I was mostly interested in. Like I, I want to go somewhere and be a professor and just like be there. And this isn't an option for everybody in every field, obviously like 
I can't believe I managed to find quite a few. It, it, I think part of it is the California community colleges are on kind of this last arc of uh, COVID funding and everything's expiring this year. And so they're hiring full-time faculty as best they can so that they have, they have the people for when times are leaner so that they, that like they can afford to have these people. They, they have these approved lines of instruction, but um, uh, yeah. So, so I, I think I'm on the end of this wave of hiring for a while. Um, okay. But uh, I applied to seven different California community colleges. I got interviews for three. I interviewed at the first one, didn't make it to the second round. Um, I got, and then uh, Pasadena, so where I actually teach is um, the second one that uh, interviewed me and I went through the whole thing. I had a third interview really close by it, like, it's like our rival school for some sports. I don't know, but <laughs> I didn't actually make it there because I was offered the job before I made it there yeah. and, and Pasadena was my number one. So I, out of all of the seven, I like looked at all the schools and looked at all the campuses and like who does stuff where and whatever. And uh, I realized that I, I chose or I prioritized, I guess. And I, I, I kind of focused on Southern California because um, most of my professional connections are actually down here. Like mm -hmm. I, I did a lot of work in Northern California and um, have a lot of great people there, but I don't know many people outside of the school. And that's less helpful if you're trying to be at a community college and um, give your students opportunities in the area. But you need, you need some community base. And so since I know people in industry down here and in government down here um, or, you know, environmental policy kind of stuff, um, I was like, I think I could do the best and make the best impression in Southern yeah. California because I already have these connections from undergrad. And so that's kind of how it worked out. There's a lot of people who also went to Cal State Long Beach, um, either for undergrad or grad school in my department, which is really cool. Um, the, so I think I'm on the last, I was on, I'm on the first or last or I'm on the first wave of grad students who are finally defending in person. I'm also on the last wave of grad students, uh, or potentially, uh, interviewing almost purely on Zoom. And so I had like my preferred Zoom background and I've got like new blouses, but, uh, but I'm like interviewing in pajama pants and yeah. a nice shirt like I might be right now. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, I have gym shorts on right now, even though I have a button up. <laughs> I mean, you know, just like impressions. So, mm -hmm. so I'm like, I'm wearing comfortable pants, but like a sure. button up shirt. And I'm like, I got to the point where I was maybe over strategizing. I was like, okay, what shirts are they all wearing on their faculty website? Like, can I get, nice. just like, can I get personality enough? Like, cause I'm yeah. wearing like a shirt with like, flowers on it i'm like okay is this is this a little crazy do they need a little bit more of a serious button-up situation like should i get a plain color or but they're yeah. all wearing like little lightning bolts and whatever like it was so i was like i feel like i can fit in with these folks like it'll be it'll be fine um and so my first interview was very straightforward they gave it they gave you the questions they gave everyone the questions an hour in advance or half an hour in advance something like that mm -hmm. very close so that like you can't just like go google stuff and make stuff up, but like fast or enough time to kind of rationalize what they're going to ask you in advance. So that was, that was nice. Um, but I, I, there were like nine people plus me in the zoom room. It was kind God. of, it was a lot, it was of, kind lot of intense. People. Yeah. And they had a lot of questions that were like, it was, it was technical upfront. So they're asking me like about teaching, like philosophy and what did I teach and what's my favorite um, thing to do? And I had to prepare a two minute lecture and it, they timed it two minutes exactly on um, neurotransmitters. So uh, you'll be familiar, but uh, for those who don't, it's the thing that comes out of a nerve cell to communicate with another nerve cell or I don't know, whatever your brain's trying to send a message to basically. So um, neurotransmitter lecture, that I had to give with like slides and they're like, wow. you can send us the PDF of a slide of a worksheet if you'd like. And I was like, worksheet. So <laughs> maybe it was a, 
yeah, maybe it was five minutes. If like, cause I had like an active learning activity that I crammed into there. I'm like, okay, yeah. you're going to go in breakout rooms and talk for 30 seconds and come right back. Or, it was bonkers. And so I was like, but I felt like I did really well. Like I, I, I mm-hmm. felt like I got good feedback. There were smiling faces, follow up questions. Cause I think when you're doing an interview, if you ask, if you answer the question and there's no follow up, yeah, like either you talk too much or it was like, oh, cool. <laughs> but if they come up with right. something else to ask you to build on that, that means that they like what they heard and want to hear more generally is my understanding. or it's that, That's what it felt like anyway. Um, so that was my first interview. And they were like, okay, if you get it, then your second interview will be tomorrow. And so I had to clear out my schedule for two whole days because I didn't, because I'm like, I knew when my first appointment was, but then it's like, hey, I might not come to class or I might not be able to teach Wednesday morning or sometimes like, because I don't know, they're going to give me an interview maybe tomorrow. And I don't know when it's going to be, hopefully not during class, but like, I might not be there, Mm. (laughs) but it, it, the scheduling worked out, but I did have to like interview the first thing the next morning. And I, they wanted me to pick a, pick a scientific paper that you would share with students and like have a justification for why, but I lucked out because I have a paper that I love that is about how the shape of bird eggs evolved. Mm. Super simple, but super fascinating. There's a lot, it was a, it's a great science paper, like a lot of great research about it. It's a 2018 paper. And yeah. so I got to be a nerd and really show them like, Hey, like I didn't just pick any random paper. I know this paper already and I love it. And here's why I think students would really engage with this. And so, so there was, I got to build on that and they let me know like the next day, I think that I made it to the final round. And so that was, um, out of hundreds, I think they interviewed 20 and then I made it to the top two and mm-hmm. very intimidating. And then, so they, they had me come down and, uh, but my experience of interviews is like, oh, they'll bring you over and like to give you a tour of campus and like answer any questions, like you meet other faculty and get to kind of kick, kick the tires, whatever. Um, no, for, for mine, I showed up and I showed up at HR and then they, <laughs> I was half an hour late because I showed up to HR on time and HR miscommunicated with the president's office and uh no one came to get me but no one brought me and so i just kind of waited until they figured out what happened and then they brought me to my interview half an hour after i was supposed to be doing it so i was already like up to here nervous and i met with uh the department dean and the vice president and president of the college and it's this huge like cartoonish uh like high ceiling long table uh, conference room and they're like they asked me like the very corporate questions they were like where do you see yourself in 10 years yeah and because I'm because I'm me I <laughs> my answer was immediately well here I hope yeah <laughs> sure. the audacity <laughs> right. it worked right but but I got to explain myself at least I was like well I hope here and this is why, <laughs> because yeah. my answer was like, I'm hoping to find the place that I'm going to, like I applied for a tenure track job because I want to actually be starting my, my professorship somewhere. Mm-hmm. I want to land somewhere. I'm not trying to be here, develop myself for a little while and leave. Like I want to build a program here. So like, yes, I actually do see myself here. In yeah. Thank you. Um, but it was, it was questions like that. And there was a little bit of follow-up from my CV. Um, they were interested in the um, anti-racist practices paper I was on. They're like, so what did you do for this paper? Because there were like 30 authors on this paper, but I sure. was there from planning stages on. So my writing isn't necessarily in there because stuff got moved around and like section whole sections got pulled out. And I was like, oh no. But I did a lot of editing and I helped with figures and stuff. So I, I got to talk about that as well. And so I think that what community colleges are looking for when they're advertising for these full-time positions is that there's people that um, it's not necessarily their knowledge, it's their training and potential for um, 
being able to work with a, a variety of communities of students is my understanding of what one of my strengths was. Yeah, that's awesome. So when, when did they give you the offer? Two hours after my interview. Wow. Um, the story is actually good. So, so I like called my mom and I was staying in a hotel across the street. So I like walked across the street and like, you know, like relaxed for a second, called my mom, debriefed, and then like called my advisor. She didn't answer the phone. She didn't get my voicemail. I had to call her back the next day, but whatever. <laughs> she just didn't see it. I don't know. She's a very busy yeah, one. Um, sure. so, and then I called my dad, debrief with him. And, okay. Um, I'm going to get some ice cream. There's an ice cream store like two doors down. And then I'm just going to like, walk through this pretty neighborhood. And so I have this ice soft serve cup in my hand and I'm walking down the street and my phone rings and I'm like, I'm a millennial. I'm like, Oh God, what's it doing? And so I'm like, oh, okay. I'm getting a phone call and, and notice what area code it is. Like, oh, that was really fast. They're probably telling me no right now, but like, okay, you know, did my best. I felt good about it, but you know, okay. So I answer the phone. I'm like, hi. And it's my, the Dean. And she's like, hi, how's it going? And I'm like, good. <laughs> I, I just got some ice cream and walking around. She's like, cool. Well, I'm calling to offer you the position and my hands like, and so I had to set this ice cream down on the sidewalk um, mm. and not throw it, spike it in the street. Cause that's what I was ready to do. I was like ready to be publicly embarrassing in front of people. Like there's an old man walking his like even older father down the street. And yeah. like, I'm standing off to the side getting like, trying to stay calm and I'm like I'm sure I'm sweaty and red and like oh and she was like yeah just call in to offer you and you know you can take your time I'm like oh no you're my number one like I'm taking this job thank you and she's like great we'll send you an email so you can verbally confirm and we'll get you all whatever and I was like oh my god and so I had to hang up and then call my, my spouse and be like we're moving to Pasadena and I'm screaming we're moving to Pasadena like multiple people are like what is happening <laughs> like I've I, I'm I'm a publicly emotive person. Yeah. <laughs> In case you haven't told, been able to tell from the last like hour, but yeah, so it was very exciting, but shocking that they offered it to me so quickly. And I, I haven't really yeah. got the story about it, but like I don't think it's really that important. Um, I I don't know who the other person who was interviewing was, but um, mm. yeah, yeah, they they offered. I thought it was going to take like two weeks, and it took two hours. Yeah. <laughs> I was just yeah. like. That was, it was very jarring because I, I just didn't expect that. That was so awesome. Did you, um, I have to ask, did you do any salary negotiation or anything like that? What was that like? No, um, since it's a public school um, and since it's a pretty straightforward position, like there is a pay table uh, online yeah. and like I knew what to expect before I yeah. got there. But what For was sure. interesting though, the negotiable thing, the the thing that they can adjust is how many years of experience you have. So I mm. I was hired right out of grad school, but I had been a teaching assistant for three years and I taught every semester. So I, I, I had at least part-time teaching for three years and um, it wasn't just like, oh, grading. Like I actually designed assignments for the class. I taught the labs, I whatever. And so being able to build that up and have that conversation with HR and with um, the people that was were interviewing me, I actually started at step six instead of step three, which is what I would have anticipated. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm going to mo start moving down. Like I, I'll start making money sooner um, mm -hmm. on that pay scale. And there's also... Um, at least at my school, they have professional development for folks who are starting full-time faculty positions with master's degrees. And so if you do a certain number of hours of, um, of professional development, then they move you up toward the doctorate level pay. Um, and so that, that's how you get pay raises is by putting into professional development time. Yeah. And it's yeah. so cool. At least it's straightforward. So you don't have to do this yeah. crazy negotiating and like, yeah, I just, I just got what I got. And I, I mean, it, it was, it's base pay anyway, but um, I get to move up sooner. Yeah, that is awesome. So what is community college professor life like? It, so it, it's good in the fact that it's what I was hoping for, which was like, 
research, like I can wrap up my own research in my own time um, and kind of de-escalate like the last of my PhD publishing stuff. But I'm really excited about getting to do some course design that I'm currently teaching general biology and human physiology, um, mm -hmm. very different classes because it's gen bio for non-majors. And so it's like people who are trying to tick oh. a box so that they can go be a business major. And then also um, it, human physiology is like pre-nursing. And so I mm. feel this responsibility for this class that I got to design a lot of myself. Like I, the content is, there's a requirement for content, but like, how I deliver that content is all up to me. The gen bio, there's nine sections of it. And so we all collaborate so that everybody gets kind of a even baseline experience. Yeah. So, um, sorry, my cat is really mad that, <laughs> that she can't take part. She has something to say apparently. Um, mm. So <laughs> I, uh, um, I've been really enjoying being able to build classes. I'm already, um, I've been designated as the course lead for marine biology for next year. And so I'm going to start, I'm going to, we're still seeing what classes I'm going to teach in the fall. It kind of depends on the two people that they're hiring for my department. So I don't know who those people are going to be yet. So we'll see. But um, since I'm, I'm the newest, I'm, I don't have the seniority to like kind of say where I go. Sure. Um, so, so there's that, but, um, but I did get to generally, tell them like what my, what, where I would shine as an instructor. And they're like, we haven't had a proper, like someone who is an actual marine biologist here in a while. And uh, we would love you to teach marine biology. And that's such a full circle moment for me, because if you recall mm, an hour ago, I said that I took intro to marine biology at my community college and it made me become a marine biologist. And so it's, I'm very excited at the prospect of being able to do that. And I told the guy, cause I still talk to that marine biology instructor from, you know, 15 years ago. And, and he is so excited and so proud because he just retired from that community college. And so oh. I'm like taking up the mantle, so to speak, haha, ha, that's an octopus joke. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> the mantle yep, went right over the back of the head. Yeah. Yeah. Went <laughs> so, right over my mantle. <laughs> so I'm just really excited and that I get to, design like and i'm i'm validated too i'm being supported too and and i have to finish doing the budget report so i could get some funding to um develop a really interesting and impactful class and i have the flexibility to do that they trust me to do that so um that's what community college in teaching has been like so far i think yeah. the worst part has probably been the fact that um everyone is very slowly coming back to campus and you're mm. usually not there most folks are not usually there when they're not in office hour so yeah. i'm i have a cubicle in a room with 12 one two three four, 15 15 um little cubes mm -hmm. and um maybe two or three people are there on a good day yeah. um at the same time as me like i i really rarely see folks and so it, it's been a little isolating just because i haven't been able to talk to many people in person about stuff i have questions about and so like a lot of my faculty training has been more about like pedagogy than the ins and outs of like how do I, how do I drop a student from my class? Like, yeah. so I'm, I'm still working on like the admin of it all, but, um, and learning to like making my department friends and it's a little slow going just because we're not in the same room at the same time usually, but, um, the teaching itself, the classes are pretty darn good. And I have some really interesting, really fun students that I think I'm going to talk to for quite a while. So, um, it's exciting to develop those um, student instructor relationships and um, the tenure process has uh, like, I've already done my first tenure review. They do it in the first semester. So um, just uh, making sure that you're on the right track for the next few. And so mm -hmm. um, we have a really straightforward four year tenure process, the first year, second year, and then in the fourth year combined for the third and fourth year. So three, three total, and then you receive tenure. Um, for your fifth year. And so um, they, it was really straightforward, just like, let's see what your canvas looks like. Give us an example of a, an assignment that you've done. Um, and then 
had a couple of classroom observations and that was pretty much it. So um, yeah. really, really straightforward, really not the same tenure process as a research professor because re professors mm -hmm. who have to do research are like, they have to publish and they have to mentor students. And there's all of this other stuff that I knew I'm capable of it. And it's something that I could do, but it would take everything I had. And I really yeah. don't, like my goal was to ha have an academic job because I know this is where I belong. I just don't belong in a job that takes everything from me. And then I don't get to have a life outside. And like, I've yeah. generally been able to keep this work within the work week, which is nice. Um, did I cut out there for a second? Maybe a little bit, but you're back. Okay, so so I, I've been able to keep my work generally within work. They're expecting like 45 hours a week or so. Um, and I've been generally been able to keep that Monday to Friday and I don't really have to work weekends um, sometimes, but um, it's all a matter of like, I'm trying to sort out how to be efficient about doing all sure. the trading, keeping it all together. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, it's been, awesome. it's been really, really, um, freer than I expected it to be and, uh, pretty straightforward. It just has taken a lot of, uh, self-advocacy for how to do the administrative stuff, uh, appropriately. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's fun. That's awesome. That's awesome. So for we're, we're running close on time. So I want to drill down with a couple just like quick fire questions. So for grad students listening who are, you know, they've done a little bit of research, maybe they've done a little bit of teaching or TA work, um, and they're looking towards the future towards job opportunities. What would you say? Um, why do you think being a community college professor is compelling? And then whenever you're done with that, talk about maybe like who it wouldn't be a good fit for or something to that effect. Ah, so um, it's compelling for folks who are really interested in the teaching process. There's a lot of development in um, authentic assessments, like instead of just giving students busy work, um, you really need to be caring about how your students are able to learn they're not here for busy work and if you give them busy work mm -hmm. they will not do it um and the other fantastic development has been chat gpt i've graded uh. uh, chat gpt is doing really well in all my classes tell you that um <laughs> so you have to be ready to get creative about how yeah. you're interacting with your students how you're course correcting them uh, and so there's a lot of people management involved and a lot of them also, um, we've talked about or kind of mentioned zoom high school in here. A lot of these folks don't understand intuitively what a teaching environment is at this point. Like they didn't, mm -hmm. they haven't been in a classroom in a while. And so they're going to ask you if they can go to the bathroom and it, like, yeah. and it's like, just go, you're an adult, but also like, Hey, if you're going to be late. You need to talk to, you have to be very clear and very repetitive and be mm -hmm. ready to do that and just intellectualize that. So that, that's kind of what you have to prepare for when you're teaching, like if your focus is teaching and if you're excited for that or like feel like you can tolerate and um, not come off as like, oh, just go to the bathroom. Like if, if, right. if people management, if, if managing teenagers is frustrating to you, community college is not going to be it because they're 18, 19, 20, and they don't just magically yeah. become functional adults once they graduate high school as <laughs> I'm sure we all, everyone listening is like, Oh yeah, I, I definitely do. Remember what, what, what were you like <laughs> when you were 18? Yeah. You have yeah. 30 of them in your classroom at any given point And uh, you have to um, make it fun and exciting um, and really consider them and their lives as people. I've also done a lot of like, they're grieving, they're ill, yeah. they're have to, they're worried. They don't think they can come to you. They don't think they can ask you for help. They have asked you for help before and they feel like they're asking too much. Um, so yeah, just a lot of people management. This is, so this is for people who are really interested in helping um, students who are transitioning from high school get to a point wherever they need to go. A lot of them are going to be transfer students, but not all of them. So you're considering students that are, taking your class for a variety of reasons too. Mm -hmm. um, they, they could be trying to get an AA. They're just, I, I've had like a grandmother who's just in it because it's interesting. Like 
wide spectrum. So you have to be ready for that. You're not getting like hyper attentive, hyper competitive University of California students anymore, or I'm not yeah. anyway. Um, it's not for folks who want to do research um, sure. or like primarily research, uh, at least not the tenure track level. Like if you want to adjunct and like teach a class and then also do research and on a separate, in a separate plane of things, that's great. But like my job is not primarily research. It's not going to be primarily research. I can build research projects into my classes, which is awesome. Um, it's good for the student. It's good for me, but I can't, I don't have a lab. I'm never going to have a lab. Um, I can mentor students, but only so far and it has to be pretty mm -hmm. creative unless I can get grants to do that. So um, it's really primarily for folks who are interested in teaching a broad, a broad spectrum of students. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, this has been such a great conversation, Kelly. Um, as we're starting to wrap up, will you uh, throw out the name of your podcast? Or it's Spinal Frontier. The Spinal yeah, Frontier. Will you describe it again? It is. Uh, so my spouse and I watch a lot of Star Trek, like a lot of Star Trek, a lot of Star Trek. And they, they'll they say stuff about an alien's body. And I always make them pause because I'm like, hey, hold on a second. They just said their first set of ears. What does that mean, though? Because hmm. I'm a physiology person. And so I want to know. And so we just started recording the conversation. So it's about 20 minutes long, every episode, we talk about some aspect of alien physiology. Sometimes we talk about a, uh, alien species on Star Trek. Sometimes we talk about like ears or eyes or communication is our latest episode as of this recording. So um, just how, how aliens speculate, wild speculation as to like what aliens must be like inside their bodies and where they must live and stuff like that. So if you're interested in just like me being a goober with my spouse and just like yammering about Star Trek and science for 20 minutes at a time or so, maybe 30 minutes if you're lucky, <laughs> then the Spinal Frontier is for you. Spinal Frontier. All right, folks, check out Spinal Frontier. Uh, I'll have a link to that in the description of this episode. And you said you're on Instagram with it as well. We're on Instagram, we're on Tumblr, and we've started a YouTube channel. Very cool. Very cool. Okay, so I'll have links uh, in the description of this episode. Uh, Kelly, was there anything you wanted to talk about that we didn't talk about? Um, I don't think so. I, yeah, I just, I'm just happy at a community college, and um, I encourage folks to DM me. It's okay to DM me on the Spinal Frontier account. I'm the one who runs the it on Instagram, and so your message will get to me um, if you have more questions about how community college teaching works or why why not, why to leave research what 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 made me think to, that i need to leave research whatever um i'm always happy to chat with folks but um i, <laughs> I could talk forever so i'm just gonna not <laughs> absolutely so uh so final question um for folks who are uh compelled by the idea of being a community college professor what is something that they should do while they're still a grad student to kind of prepare them for applying to those jobs? Um, teaching certificates. So mm. um, check with your, your university or your college, see if there is any kind of like pedagogy, which is the study of studying, right? Um, any kind of active learning training, any kind of um, anti-racist education certificate, um, anything that shows that you are excited and interested in best practices in learning and interested and excited in best practices in working with other people. And that demonstrates beyond like knowledge, you actually care about the skills that it takes to work with people and teach them things and help them learn. Yeah, yeah, that is awesome. It's awesome. Dr. Kelly Voss, thank you so much for coming on the show. Everyone check out Spinal Frontiers. Look at the description of this episode for links to everything. And Kelly, thank you so much. It was great to chat with you. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Folks, thank you for tuning into the Grad School Sucks podcast. I hope you got a lot out of our episode today. If you did, please consider leaving a rating or a view on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And be sure to check out the description of this episode for links to everything that we covered today. As always, I'm your host, Dr. Matt Carlson, and I look forward to bringing you another great episode next week. See y'all next time.